Welcome to the Week in IndyCar on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires, our very first episode of 2019 with our man Graham Rahal joining in. Spent a little over an hour with Graham, really fun stuff from him. He has a couple of hilarious items, one including the best prank he ever played on his dad, which uh, has a cruel one. Cruel but funny. Those two tend to go together. Get into a lot of business stuff, and I really, really enjoyed that part of our conversations, knowing that Graham is probably the paddock leader in his off-track business, exploits among the drivers, and so a lot of stuff there, not only what he's doing currently with his performance-related business, but also if we look at what he did back in the day to get his career back on track and having to find businesses to support him, so really enjoyed that with our man, Mr. Ray Hall uh, also got into the reason behind why he stepped away from the Acura Team Penske IMSA program, which I don't know if he's ever fully explained before, but good stuff there from him. Have some great questions, super great questions that have come in via Reddit, Facebook, and Twitter, and we got to almost all of them. was really happy, and the quality of questions as well, just phenomenal. So thank you for sending those in. Big news so far this week, IndyCar's TV package. We'd been hoping that NBC Sports would be putting quite a few races on broadcast channel, the uh, big NBC compared to just its cable NBCSN outlet, and we do have that almost 50%, uh, 8 out of the 17 races will be on big NBC. Obviously, we'd love to get back to a time where all of the IndyCar races are on broadcast. I don't know if that's going to happen ever but I am celebrating the fact that approximately 50% will be on Big NBC. And not just for the, uh, I guess, the maybe the common reasons. I'm really happy for IndyCar's current sponsors and the potential new sponsors that should be more attracted to getting in and or those who are here spending more money. You might say, well, hey, wait a minute, Pruitt. Uh, what about cord cutting? Uh, isn't the, the art of sitting down on your couch looking at the big TV and watching a race in that manner, isn't that reducing year after year? Very much so. Can't argue that at all. Where the positive here happens to be, and this I think is going to continue for the next year or two, not sure how long, but if we look at how sponsors value uh, the TV offerings from a series like IndyCar, at present, that almighty Nielsen rating that comes from traditional television broadcasting That is what they hold dear. That's the number they look to when deciding how much they are going to spend, or at least hopefully agree to, based on how much they're being asked for from the series and or the teams. We do expect that to shift as digital and streaming delivery, whether it's through your Hulu or pick all the various ways that you might watch uh, IndyCar racing uh, other than sitting in front of a television. We expect those numbers and that rating system to only become more important to sponsors in the future when they determine the values of what to spend. But at least for right now, these eight races on Big NBC, that can only help the series, can only help the teams. Now they can really offer what should be bigger ratings numbers. Bigger numbers equal more dollars. So for that, I would say of all the wins we're looking at and what came out in the Uh, revealing of the TV package and what's going to be on when, that's it. Uh, I would also guess, a strong guess, that a couple years from now, if we do see the anticipated growth in the money being spent, in the amount of sponsors coming in, probably going to look back to this 2019 TV package as being an agent of change, of positive change in that direction. Normally, we get to our friends at Toronto Motorsports and pick my favorite question from the previous week and award that person a t-shirt, a Week in IndyCar t-shirt that gets sent out by my pal Derek Koska at his torontomotorsports.com racing memorabilia shop. Deciding to do something a little different for 2019 and like this show, which is 100% driven by you, all listener and IndyCar fan questions driven Hoping to get some input here. We're not sure what to do. Uh, Just continuing to give away a t-shirt each week to my favorite uh, question that comes in. Uh, We could do that, but we're also wondering, I don't know, what else should we do? And it's very much a participatory show, 
And so part of what we try and do here, what Derek and I came up with, you know, over a year ago was like, well, hey, uh, without the listeners, this wouldn't be that much of a show. So what can we do just to give back a little bit? And that's what drove the idea to give away t-shirts. But who knows? They do great stickers. I think they're going to be some Weekend Indy Car and also Weekend Sports Car hats that Toronto Motorsports going to be presenting and such uh, for purchase that maybe we could give those away. I don't know. But since you all send in so many great questions each week, maybe you can send us some ideas on what we should do to pick a different listener each week and give something, share something for uh, whatever it is. So I don't know. Send in your ideas. Let us know. Give us some thoughts. And we will try and come up with something to continue the trend of a weekly TorontoMotorsports.com giveaway on the good old week in IndyCar presented by Cooper Tires. We also start off the show before we get to our guest with me answering the questions you have sent in specifically for yours truly. Nice blend here across Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. So let me go ahead and kick this off and then we will get to our man, Graham Rahal. Going to go with our man Bobby Rooney to start. Bobby has sent in a great question for me asking about my five favorite races from the cart champ car and IndyCar era, non-Indy 500s, and asking why any of those resonate or have a special memory attached. I'm going to have to give that one some thought, Bobby. The The little secret here is while my good friend and colleague Robin Miller has a steel trap for a mind and can remember who passed the other guy at Milwaukee in 1984 on lap 17... Uh, that's not how my brain works. So, yeah, I usually got to get a little bit warmed up or uh, flip through some old magazines or yearbooks to really jog the memory. So, give me a little bit of time on that, Bobby. I'll try and come up with something for you here. Lots of favorites in there. They just aren't on tap like our man Miller can do. Let's go to Tom Boyers next. Tom says, Hi, Marshall. I live in the UK, and I've been looking for a while online for an outlet where I can purchase quality, high-resolution action photographs for display at home specifically shots of Dan Weldon from the 2011 Indy 500, which he says he was fortunate to attend. Can I recommend any websites, outlets, or photographers that I could contact or buy from? Uh, Definitely. There's one that comes to mind in particular, Tom, and I'll explain this quickly up front to maybe explain why not many come to mind. Uh, Even in what I do as a member of the media, uh, as a reporter, photographer, video, blah, blah, blah person, We all sign uh, the waivers for our hard cards that we receive, uh, the annual uh, hard cards that grant us access to every IndyCar round. For photographers in particular, and this isn't just IndyCar, it's IMSA and it's many other racing series, if you are a commercial photographer, meaning someone who is there, part of an agency, a lot of clients, someone who also maybe wants to sell those photographs, there's a second tier agreement and it costs a lot of money. It's essentially the, hey, you are using our product on track to make your living and to generate income for you through photography, so therefore we are going to want a significant wedge of money for you to have the rights to do that. And only those people, only those uh, entities that pay for that much higher, or for that higher level, I should say, of agreement are then allowed to take the photographs that they uh, that they produce and sell those. That means that the vast majority, and I do mean the absolute, it's a very uh, large number of those who shoot uh, any IndyCar event are not allowed to sell the photographs that they take. Uh, so with that said, the number one outlet that comes to mind is LATUSA. Uh, that's run by Michael Levitt, um, his partner Leslie and such. They've been doing phenomenal work in IndyCar for decades. Uh, Levitt's team with everyone from Phil Abbott, Scott LePage, Sam Cobb, etc., etc. A lot of fine photographers there. I would reach out to them first. I would look for LATUSA online. Uh, Mr. Levitt in particular is fairly active on the good old Facebook, so you could probably drop him a note. But they are certainly uh, part of a company that sells the images that they take each weekend. And knowing that Mike has also done a lot of wonderful work with the uh, the late and dear Danny Boy, especially during that 2011 Indy 500 win, 
I would reach out to LAT. That would be my first, first stop. And if Mike does not have what you want to purchase, I'm sure he might be able to recommend some others. Let's go to our pal Tim Calabro, who usually sends in hilarious stuff and did today as well. Uh, A little bit of a more serious one. Uh, Tim says, onboard starters. Technology has improved since the 1990s. It can be a spec part, and it could improve competition and safety with fewer yellows. Are they being considered for the new car? Tim referencing when we have various spins and stalls and the time needed for IndyCar to throw a red flag, go out and retrieve that car, and possibly that driver and the safety crew being at risk and exposed to other cars traveling by at whatever rate of speed. I would say there's no chance, Tim. I have heard nothing about this. Uh, I know that there are some fans uh, who rail on this topic regularly, need onboard starters, too much time wasted, etc. I get it. I hear you. I just know that within the paddock, there's no one calling for them. I have not heard Chevy or Honda say, we got to have it incorporated into the new car. Haven't heard IndyCar say it. Um, I'm not sure how this would change unless there was the big proverbial light bulb that went off over people's heads within the series say, got to make this change, have to have it happen. Uh, so, yeah, I I don't know if we are going to see onboard starters with IndyCars in my lifetime, but if it's something you really want, then our man Jay Fry is pretty active on Twitter, so drop him a note. Let's go to Taroki2 from Reddit. It says, I know there's still a few months left before the beginning of the season, Yet there seems to be no news from the Junkos and Carlin garages. Have I heard anything, Marshall? Uh, Great question. Definitely uh, among the top topics for me in IndyCar of things that are unresolved. Did ask our man Robin Miller to drop Trevor Carlin uh, a, a line, see if Trevor might have anything new to offer and what's happening in his world. From the last things that I think I reported a couple of months ago, uh, we know that Max Chilton will be back. Max had been telling a number of people he was considering doing the Mike Conway plan of only doing road courses. I don't know if that is something that uh, has been decided upon to go forward or not. Max is not always the most receptive to conversations uh, about such things. So normally I just reach out to the driver and say, hey, what are you doing? Max has just never been that guy. Uh, So hopefully Robin can get some updates for us from Trevor. We also know that uh, at least how things were a few months ago, our pal Charlie Kimball was facing a budget reduction that might have left him in the half-season zone or splitting a car with somebody for the season. Still need to catch up with Chuck to see if he has found additional sponsorship to allow him to continue and do more races, maybe return as a full-timer. And Trevor also has that third car, that third Chevy-powered entry. He's mentioned he uh, would like to put on the grid and thinks he can. So, uh, unfortunately, more question marks here than actual hard answers to offer. But hopefully our man Miller will bring something back and get that up on Racer.com fairly soon. On the Ricardo Junco's front, did catch up with Ricky a little bit last weekend at Daytona for the Roar before the 24. He has mentioned he plans on having two entries for the Indy 500 and would like to do more IndyCar races with one of those entries. A little bit of a unsteady point for him. Uh, he definitely said when we spoke about a month ago that he's having more people inquire about the IMSA stuff than IndyCar. And yeah, he also mentioned, and we know that Kyle Kaiser, who drove for him last year uh, at a number of IndyCar rounds, is working to find money to return. Would definitely think You could pencil in, I wouldn't put it in permanent ink yet, but pencil in Kyle for one of those Indy 500 entries. Not sure who would be in the second, and would assume that Kyle can find a few dollars to do some other rounds. But have to admit, uh, there's a definite, not worry here, but what you don't want to see is a young, newish IndyCar team like Ricardo's struggling going into their third year. I know they only did the Indy 500 in... 2017, uh, so we're not talking about a team that's done a couple of full seasons, but you know, 2019 is their third, and uh, I do hate to hear that they haven't had as many uh, takers as one would hope. I have heard from uh, a couple of other drivers who've at least inquired with Ricardo recently about the Indy 500, so 
I think there are some folks that are realizing that if you do want to play IndyCar, it's pretty much a Hunkos or Carlin world right now because there just aren't many other seats available, whether it's a full season or for the 500 itself. So uh, still a little bit early, though, as you mentioned. But, I mean, heck, we're a month away now from the uh, the big, big Laguna test that I believe pretty much all every team is going to turn up for. And then the more or less all skate everyone turn up for Coda just a couple of days later. So while it's early and the first race is two months away, if you're going to be serious and you're going to want to hit the track and, and have a real chance, you're going to be at one of those, if not both of those tests in a month. So time is actually ticking away pretty quickly. Uh, let's go back to Tim Calabro, who asks, do team own their content rights? Could a team sell access to a live stream of their radio communications, pit cameras, limited telemetry, and onboard cameras during on-track activity? I know they can't use IndyCar's equipment uh, or content, but what about their own? I think this falls, Tim, into a similar thing like I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago with Tom's question about photo uh, purchasing and rights. To my knowledge, just about everything you mentioned here is more or less signed away uh, to IndyCar. And I believe that is driven heavily by uh, TV partnership between IndyCar and its past partners and current sole partner in NBC Sports. Uh, those are things where pretty much your likeness and kind of sort of everything you do, uh, you hand over and give them rights. As for the ability to sell some of these, these things, I don't know, you know, can, could we do that with a pit camera and monetize that? Again, I don't know the exact uh, limitations on some of the things you mentioned, but I would say that if there were any rights and abilities to sell those things to sponsors and advertisers, uh, there'd probably be yet another financial transaction that takes place. I know that this happens with the video, for example. Uh, most teams will film something, you know, on pit lane, a uh, little bit of car stuff, driver climbing in or maybe peeling out, but anything on track, uh, teams are prohibited from filming and using any of that unless they execute an agreement, and that also costs a serious chunk of money. So uh, I think the overarching thing here is to both, uh, all these things are possible, just depends on how much uh, the series, this case it's IndyCar, but others as well, how much the series is asking for uh, for you to be able to have those rights, and can you afford it, and do you think you could make a profit to make that upfront expenditure worth it? Uh, let's see, let's go here to Matthew Featherman. He says, why don't teams change liveries at least every year, at least in some aspect? I would think for die-cast models and other memorabilia, you'd want to buy a new version every year. Some cars never seem to change or do so infrequently. Great question, Matthew. Uh, I would say this is, and it's a hundred percent valid, uh, certainly from a fan's perspective. But let me offer the other perspective of which provides the answer. If you, for example, sold the advertising rights to your house, and a company came to you and said, "Hey, we want to use your house to." put our logos on it, and promote our product. In doing that, you would essentially be receiving money in exchange for giving the control of what is going to be placed on the house and that and the colors uh, to the company. That is, that is the exchange. And in this situation with racing sponsorships, it's the same exact thing. Uh, teams, by and large, do not control what is going on to their cars if we're talking about, say, a primary sponsor. If we're looking at Verizon, I think that might be a good example of what you're referring to. Year after year, it's willpower in that silver number 12. Uh, that is what Verizon pays them for. That is the uh, contract that is agreed upon, and it is not up to Team Penske to say, well, hey, this year we want to throw in this, want to throw in that. You have a company paying them millions of dollars to place their logos on that vehicle using their corporate colors and that is why we have uh, some teams that have cars that look very similar year after year. The other big thing to keep in mind Matthew is the lovely subject of corporate identity. In each of the major brands that we will see in motor racing 
they will have huge, almost thick as a book type documents they've come up with that spell out exactly how their logos must look, the colors that must be used with it, not only the font, but also the size. They will give exact ratios. It can be this wide by this tall. I mean, truly, <laughs> some of IndyCar's technical regulations are actually less complex than the, uh, the identity, the, the true corporate ID documents that are used. And in these cases, whether it is a DHL on Ron Hunter Ray's car, uh, over on Rossi's, his uh, Napa colors and, and logos and just everything there, run across all the various teams and what they have for major partners and sponsors. And they will be uh, thoroughly addressed in the liveries that are made up with the car by using the corporate identity uh, framework of what they can and cannot do. You can place shading behind this logo, a drop shadow, but you can't on this one. It's, it is a highly complex thing. So, But the takeaway here is for most of the teams, especially the ones that have you know real identifiable sponsors, teams aren't the ones saying, hey, this is what we want the car to look like. It's the sponsors saying, this is what we're paying you for. The, this happens to be our corporate ID. And this is what we need to work from as the absolute base. Uh, and that's what we get each year. Some, like a Dale Coin Racing, uh, there's been times where there haven't been many sponsors on the car. Or they've been companies owned by Dale. And he'll do whatever he wants. And you'll get those changes. Uh, others, sometimes... Uh, James Sully Sullivan and Jimmy Vassar last year with Sebastian Bourdais' car. Since they were bringing the sponsors, we had the Sealmaster colors, which were fun. And then we got to Portland, and there was an ape on the car and a completely different livery. Those things I love, but that just reflects different sponsors. So instead of having a season-long sponsor, obviously there was a little bit of a tweak there with a, a special one for that round. So... Uh, or uh, something just introduced that was different than what we had seen. So, but back to your primary question, I wish teams were the ones driving the liveries on most of what we see in IndyCar, but it is not up to them to say, hey, we're going to do something new that's fun for memorabilia or die-cast reasons. Okay, getting down to the last couple you've sent in for me. We're going to go to our man Michael Swope, who's actually a big help, and thank you, Michael, for curating the reddit questions each week he says hey marshall how does ballast work he says i know that they add weight via tungsten behind the seat and under the pedals and i know they have a required minimum weight but how does the minimum weight change each year depending upon the weight of the heaviest driver also asks how does that weight affect average lap speeds at indy and adding weight could be a disadvantage or maybe an advantage for a driver like sato who probably has to add the most same with graham who's removing weight question mark Great stuff here, Mike. Uh, I would say the ballast system has become fairly standard in motor racing now. And for a spec series like IndyCar, they will indeed and ha did indeed mandate where it must go. Uh, if we look at when the Delarty W12 came out uh, for the 2012 season, the primary location was basically the keel of the car right below the driver's butt. And uh, that is where, as you mentioned, the heaviest weight that they could, that is where they would place that. The, I would say the overriding uh, two questions here is one of ballasting to achieve the same minimum weight so that a guy like Takuma Sato, who is positively tiny, versus a big old mongoloid like Graham, uh, who's 6'2", 6'3", and just you know a, a football linebacker-sized IndyCar driver, that is indeed why we have, and I'm thankful that IndyCar implemented this uh, a good while back, uh, to try and take care of what was once called the Danica Patrick rule. And that was before they said, hey, we're going to ballast everything up to make driver weights equal uh, in the eye of the scales. You certainly had someone who was going around much lighter than everyone else, and that certainly helped her on-track performance. It's not saying anything negative against Danica. She did nothing wrong. It was a generation or two ago of IndyCar Series officials who were maybe not the smartest cats in the world who allowed a smaller, lighter driver to use that lack of size to benefit their lap times. The general practice, and Graham mentions this in uh, the episode here in a moment, but 
the general numbers that I've heard, and this goes back decades, is for every 10 pounds added to a car, you lose about one-tenth of a second. So if we're thinking of Graham being, say, 50 pounds heavier than uh, a number of IndyCar drivers, in theory, if there was no adjustment of ballast to try and make everyone equal, uh, he'd be about a half second per lap slower. Uh, if we're thinking of, think of an oval where they're just going essentially flat out the entire time or almost the entire time in identical cars, albeit without the ballast to equalize those cars, Graham would just be dragging around an anchor of weight that would slow him down and therefore make that car uh, definitely not competitive. So uh, this is more or less the mindset of why they do and what they do with ballast. Uh, in the episode here, Graham mentions that the minimum weight is coming up five pounds for the year, and uh, I'm confident that that's just to try and help him get a little bit closer to meeting that minimum weight, even taking all the ballast out. Uh, you We don't always see in every series where it accommodates the heaviest driver. Sometimes that driver still just with them on board. They're just a little bit above some of the others, so hoping that that might help create even more parity once the 2019 season gets underway. Go to the last question here, also from Reddit. Comes in from Quietude38. Says, we've heard a lot this offseason about the Indy 500 car count being in the 36 car range, but how feasible is that for Honda and Chevy to support? Another great question. Uh, informal conversations held last weekend at the Roar. I know that a car count between 36 and 38. They're bracing for that uh, the, between the two manufacturers. That would mean, in theory, an equal split would be 18 entries apiece. I don't think we're going to see that being truly equal. Honda, just by, the, by what we have seen, has been the one tended to carry an extra couple of entries at the 500. So we'll see how that balances out exactly. But what we have here is the potential of 36 to 38, based on who we know has said they're coming, who we expect to turn up, but also using a little bit of history as a guide of who has turned up last year and even this year, uh, would say, keep this in mind. And Robin, uh, Robin and I are going to write about this in a upcoming Indy 500 car count anticipation story. Last couple of years, not 2018, but I would say 15, 16, 17 for sure, big questions about whether Indy was going to get to its minimum of 33 entries, the 11 rows of three cars. That being a big thing, uh, there are a couple teams that said, hey, we could turn up with an extra car, but we don't necessarily have the budget for it, IndyCar. Could you help out? We had some drivers doing the same thing. Hey, I found 200 grand, but the team wants five or six. Could you help get me there? Um, and IndyCar would. Good on them. And again, I don't see that as anything negative. Uh, if they're having to invest a little bit to uh, to have a, a grid representative of what they want, well, it's their money. They'll do with it as they please. That has continued, and I would say that did continue last year. Not as much, though, as, say, 2017, where I think there was really a hardcore effort financially uh, using maybe at least what they'd done just before that. And 15 and 16, 2017 I think might have been somewhere around the peak of how much IndyCar was coming out of pocket to make sure they had enough cars to get to that number of 33. Well, let's think about this year though. We could have just naturally with growth in the series, more entries, etc. I think we're definitely going to be 35, maybe even 36, but 34, 35 naturally. No help needed. Makes me wonder, and again, this is something Rob and I will touch on, would those same teams that were on the grid or that extra entry for some teams or that driver who really wanted to be on the show, those entities that relied upon IndyCar's generosity and forking over a couple hundred grand to get them on the grid, if there's no longer a need, if there's no longer a concern about that field of 33 being met just through natural, on-their-own entries, would IndyCar be willing to hand out those same subsidies? I don't think so. And so that's why I say the potential of 36 to 38. You take away IndyCar's help, 
I think we might see a couple teams that relied upon it, they might struggle to get there. And so that's why, again, if this turns out to be 35-36, instead of that almost encroaching on 4 or almost reaching 40 number, I think that might be a, a factor. So we'll see how that plays out. We would obviously hope that some of those teams and drivers who've rel- relied upon IndyCar to get them there, that they will indeed find their own money, won't need IndyCar to do it, then indeed I think we could be at that 36-38 number for sure. Believe Honda and Chevy will be there and ready to support that fairly big number, but I also think there might be some pressure relief with a couple who've been there uh, through last May, might not be there altogether or with an extra entry, simply because IndyCar is not helping to cover their financial shortcomings. So with all that said... Let's get going with our man, Graham Rahal. Really enjoyed this. He was he was on fire in a couple areas here. Some deep insights, some good laughs, and yeah, I know he gets some flack from folks who uh, think that a lot of what he says is disingenuous, but regardless, I, I thoroughly appreciate the time that he shares with us and takes some good deep dives in a few things that definitely worth uh, pondering for sure. So thanks again to him. Off we go with Graham Rahal. And thanks as well to you for sending in the great questions and to Cooper Tires for making this all possible. Graham Rahal, great to have you back on the Week in IndyCar podcast. You know, the one we did live at Mid-Ohio, not only was that a blast, but we've also got a lot of questions that have come in from folks, some of them who were at the live event we did in your home state. And boy, uh, you're a popular cat, man. I've got six pages of questions that have come in via Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. So we just start rock and rolling here in a moment. But you're coming out of uh, the annual meet with IndyCar, meet with Jay Fry, and uh, get some some thoughts on what's coming for the year. I know you're not at liberty to discuss all that was uh, unveiled there, but how did the meetings go? Anybody have any funny haircuts or, or do anything different fashion-wise? What was it like? <laughs> no, everything was good. You know, I felt... Uh... What I love about Jay is that everything everything goes to goes to plan. You know, he's a man of his word. When he says it, it happens. And you know, this five year plan that he laid out, what three years ago now, I think, um, or two years ago, you know, is is as scheduled and no diversions from that. And that's great because I've never seen that in racing uh, in my time, at least. And so it's uh, it's it's great to be able to witness it and, and see what he's doing. Uh, you know, Bill and Tino and uh, obviously Mark Miles working on some new races and stuff. So a lot of, I think there's a lot of good happening, you know, from a fan perspective, lots to be excited about with, you know, with NBC. I mean, just going to one, one home, um, you know, to, uh, to look at the schedule released uh, today, as far as the broadcast and to see the peacock on every race uh, is, is pretty cool uh, because, it, it, it gets rid of a lot of confusion. And as we saw, if everybody's watching NFL football last weekend, you know, we already saw some, some flashes and some advertising from our friends at NBC. So again, great thing. Um, so I'm excited about that. I think that there's uh, there's, there's a lot of good ahead of us and hopefully soon, you know, they'll have a title an- announcement and hopefully soon, you know, they'll be able to lock in a third OEM and those things happen you know, I think the rest of the motorsports world needs to buckle up because I really, really do think that IndyCar racing is on the rise in a big, big way. And I mentioned this in my cold open a little earlier, 17 races next year, eight of them on big NBC, on network television. Uh, Well, you were a much younger man. I was a much skinnier man the last time we had that many IndyCar races on a broadcast channel. Those are the kinds of things, Graham, that touch on everything you just mentioned. How do we get that third manufacturer or fourth in? How do we get more sponsors? It's being able to say, hey, yeah, we don't have a kind of a token network presence. It's we well, do have almost half of it there. Uh, that stuff matters. It matters. And the other great thing when you look at it or think about it is there are four clashes with NASCAR. And every time in the past, Mid-Ohio, my home race, that we would clash with NASCAR, we'd be shoved on CNBC. And guess what? Two of those four, we are the one that get to be on network, and they go on SN. And if you think about that, 
that's unprecedented for us. That's an opportunity that we have not had at all in recent times. You know, normally we're the redheaded stepchild that gets kind of thrown over in the corner and, you know, you go to a channel that everybody normally is only watching for money things and not for racing, right? So it's a great thing. You know, it's a great thing for our sport. Uh, once again, I give Mark Miles a lot of credit for that. You know, when Mark came in, we were talking about, I think it was seven years ago. I mean, he was dealt a, a card, you know, a hand that was pretty tough, you know, gone from versus to whatever, you know, to NBC Sports in its infancy. And, you know, I think that they found a, a great plan here. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm a fan of NBC anyway. I think that the broadcasts were far better than, than what we saw on ESPN. Um, and I, I think that that's going to continue. So, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. I think all, all the fans should be. Um, I know our partners are. You know, you better believe that the, the viewership, the ratings, the viewership as a whole, will be, I'll bet you it's up this year quite considerably. Yes, you know, free free to, to I or whatever they call them. Uh, you know, TV is, is kind, of, it's like kind of a dying breed. But I still think that the effort NBC is going to put in behind it will make up for that and we'll, we'll see some good gains. All right, before we start rocking with questions for you, there have been a number of questions, not Gray Murray Hall questions, but general questions about a certain 2003 Champ Car title winner uh, who's been posting a variety of things in social media, intimating maybe a return to IndyCar, maybe heading into the driver's meeting here. Uh, were there any signs of the super warm-hearted Paul Tracy? No, 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 no. Um, I didn't even know he was talking about getting back in the car, honestly. So, uh, it's rumors. No, it's uh, rumors. Yeah, no, no, no. I didn't see him. But, uh, hell, I mean, you know, my opinion, I still think PG can wheel the thing. I oh, mean, yeah. when I raced against him, he was he was a fierce competitor. I think he could do a good job. But, no, but what was cool was being in that meeting room. Obviously, there's a lot of talented people. But there was a lot of people. And a lot I was looking around. Normally, when I say there's a lot of people, you know, you sit in that meeting room and it's like, oh, God, you know, like all these Indy Lights guys show up and that's nothing against them. But it's like, OK, you're not an Indy car driver. So why are you in the Indy car driver only meeting? But this year, you know, as I looked around, you know, everybody was legitimately there. Um, you know, yeah, a couple people were only, you know, maybe Indy 500 uh Indy 500 only competitors, but multiple times. It's not like they were a one-off that we're never going to see again. So, you know, I thought there were a lot of very valid points brought up. I thought there were some good arguments brought up. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about plans going forward and things that we're looking at doing, I mean, I thought it was a, a really cohesive conversation. And, uh, you know, all signs point to a pretty pretty bright future, as I keep saying also got a lot of questions about your mustache. You're now former mustache, by the way, so we'll try and come back to that. Uh, let, let's kick off with our friend Alan Bandy, who says, Graham, you always seem to have been a go-getter for finding sponsorship to help better your personal racing career. What cities do you see as being untapped markets for IndyCar in terms of sponsorship and reaching out to new potential fans? Well, I think that... Um you know, I think that Austin, Texas is going to be a good one for us because we, we are a palatable sponsorship investment level. You know, a lot of times when you're talking F1 being there, that's great. But when I open the door to an F1 team, I want to be a title sponsor. You, there's a good chance that you're, the figure that you're going to be thrown is nine figures, you know. <laughs> um, for us to walk in and be in the six-figure or seven-figure to be a really high-level sponsor number to – you know, you've got Dell. You've got a lot of great uh, companies that are kind of based down in that area of the world. You know, Austin, Texas is an area. Texas as a whole is an area that is really growing as far as, you know, population due to the tax friendliness and all that sort of stuff. And a big a lot kind of, big of California uh, companies leaving. Yeah, big kind of Silicon Valley, Texas type uh, it, thing with Austin it, going it, on. It, it is. So that's good. The other one I think is good that could be on the horizon here. We keep hearing about is Richmond. And yeah, okay, Richmond, um, you know, we raced there before, but, you know, Richmond, again, is, is when you look at the top viewership based on, you know, cities and everything else, Richmond is always, always there in the top five or ten, which means there's a great following there. And when I say that in a sponsorship level, you have Washington, D.C., you've got, I mean, a lot of big demos right in a very close-knit area there in the, in the east, so... 
Uh, so I think Richmond, you know, could be a good one. I mean, I'd still like to see some sort of Chicago come back. I mean, you know, I'm a fan of Chicago land. I enjoyed it. I think that the racing we would put on there was always great, but it was two, two pack racy back in the old days, but the cars, the tires, the whole formula is different today. I think Chicago is an, an area that we ought to be trying to, uh, to get into again. Next one comes in from our pal Kevin Frederico. says, Hey, Graham, what's your favorite memory from your time with the Newman Haas team? And I know you get that frequently, but it also speaks to how much I think fans loved that team. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I mean, certainly, you know, getting my, my first win with them was, uh, was a special moment to be able to walk in that shop and all the names of the drivers that had won for them was in, on the wall in the shop. And to see my name put up there next to obviously Seb, but you know, but next to the Andretti's and next to Mansell and all these great names that we all kind of idolized, um, you know, that was a that was a pretty cool thing uh, for me. But you know, they were great people. Uh, we had a lot of great times. You know, Bernie, Carl Haas, obviously Paul Newman's. A, Paul Newman means more to me than probably almost any human being on this planet. And so, uh, you know, to get the time with him there was, was obviously uh, extremely special, too. Let's see. Why don't we go to... All right, we've got two questions that are along the same vein, both from Craig Johnson and Brian Carey. And I love this because I think there's really only about two IndyCar drivers that I actually have to look up to when I speak to them a little bit. Uh, you're one of them, and I think Rossi and I are almost eye-to-eye. Eye. He might be a little bit taller, <laughs> but uh, for the most part, you guys stand out. So we've got... Craig, who says, as a fellow six-plus footer, I'm curious, as one of the tallest drivers in the paddock, what accommodations do you have to make for your driving position in the, in the Delarty W12? And also, was there any compromise when sharing the Acura DPI? Uh, and finally, he says, what's been the most difficult car for you to fit in? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of compromises, you know. There's never a lot of room in anything that I'm in, so... You know, the pedals, I got to put them as far forward as I can at all times. The steering wheel as, as high up as I can, which means that my knuckles, particularly on the ovals, are getting blasted with rocks all the time and debris and stuff like that, which is which is not fun. Um, you know, typically I have no I have no leg room, no arm room. You know, guys today in the meetings were talking about having pads down by their knees and all this sort of thing. I physically couldn't drive in any car if I had pads all over my knees. And so there is a little bit of risk that I take. In that, and unfortunately, in the accurate DPI, as a lot of people have seen, you know, I had to step out. Uh, I had to, I had to step out, and that was a difficult decision to make. Um, you know, I was taking one for the team. I was taking one for Honda, who's been so good to me. Like, I just could not give an A effort, and I hate that. I hated being a driver. Everybody said, "Yeah, but you let it petit them off for three hours." Okay, sure, but I still couldn't give my best. Mm. And as somebody who wants to be competitive and viewed as as being one of the best in the business you, you know i just couldn't do it and feel good about myself so now obviously al has stepped in and taken my spot there alex is almost as tall as me but alex is a different build than me um you know i was talking to ricky taylor about it i mean alex is a much skinnier he's he's got a littler waist he's a thinner guy he's smaller bone um you know my 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 biceps are as big as Alex's legs, and that's no joke. So I, we're just built differently. And my biggest problem in the Acura was every time I turned the wheel, I hit my knees. Every time I hit the brake pedal, my foot was wanting to stay on the throttle because I physically could not pull my legs back to get any room. So those were issues I, I really battled heavily. And finally, you know, I had to make the decision to just kind of – to step out but the worst car i ever drove i think is either the acura or or the the bmw z4 uh, i don't race even, car i don't even know how tough. you got in that car man they needed to cut a hole in the roof so your helmet could actually just peek above the roof and drive i don't know how you it got was that. rather uncomfortable <laughs> but i did it uh all right let's go to uh, let's go to Don Gregory, who asks, which current road cars make the hair stand up on the back of your neck? And uh, have you ever thought of switching with Courtney and making a few passes in her funny car? you got a lot of those kind of questions, too. Oh, I'm sure there's a lot of those. No, I mean, I'm certainly not a, I'm not a drag racer. You know, I enjoy what I do, and I, I, I'll stick to that, um, you know, 
for the rest of my life for sure. Um, as far as road cars, you know, road car, obviously people know with my performance shop and everything else, road cars are a big part of my life. But I, I you know, I would say that, you know, probably the cars that's, that make, you know, make my hair stand up the most, uh, you know, the Porsche Carrera GT is kind of the, the goat, you know, in my opinion, I think that it's the greatest, you know, greatest car ever made. Um, that's a, that's, that's a really special one. You know, anything that sounds, anything that sounds really good kind of gets your, your, your juices flowing. I took the four GT the other day and did a Canyon run. You know, that was, that was a lot of fun. I uh, went up to Malibu and sad to see what's going on up there with all the fires and, and, you know, the recovery and the process that's going to be, but you know, um, I, I get, I'm, I'm fortunate that I get to play with these things a lot. We, we work on a lot. I was just at my performance shop here at the end of the day, kind of checking in on everything. And, you know, it's, it's packed. It's a packed house and, you know, that's extremely cool. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I love it. I absolutely love it. I already know the answer to the next question, or I know the answer you should give to the next question. It comes in from our man, Ben Cohen Graham. What's the better experience? Going on the Rich Eisen show or being the first guest star of the year on the Weekend in IndyCar with MP? And if you don't say Eisen, I'm going to have you committed. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I have to say you, right? Oh, no, don't lie. Uh, Come on. Look, I'd rather be on the Rich Eisen show than on my own show. So he's, I love that guy. You know, Rich is a great, great guy. And I love shooting the bull with him about everything obviously picking on him about Michigan and how we throttle Michigan every single year. That's, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. But what I like about Rich, he's not a racing guy, but he still is a genuine person who is interested, who follows up. I hear from him all the time. You know, I mean, that whole thing started literally, he and I were just texting. We, we text a lot, but he and I were just texting and and, you know, he said, hey, let's settle this on the show. I'll see you on, you know, on Wednesday. And, you know, I guess I'm fortunate to have that relationship with a guy that, that is, is so powerful in, in sport media, I guess. But, you know, he's a great guy. Um, we're going to get him. We're going to get him in IndyCar more. He's come to Long Beach. He loved it. We try to get him back again. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's definitely cool to, uh, to get to go on there. Amen. All right, Jamie Carr, this is definitely a great one. Jamie says, all right, Graham, you, Courtney, her dad, and your dad are all going to dinner. You have to take one car. Who drives? Oh, I, I would drive for sure. Uh, there's no doubt I would drive. <laughs> um, that is no doubt I would drive because John's driving makes me sick, makes everybody sick. My dad would want to drink wine, so I would have to drive. And my wife's a great driver, but she just likes to just sit there and talk about our dog pretty much or whatever else. So, um, yeah, I, w I would definitely, definitely drive. This question comes in from Jerry Siddoth, who is at the Mid-Ohio event that we did. And I know you've gotten this question in a few different ways. I like the angle of the second part, though. Jerry asks, is there anything from your wife's form of racing that has helped you as a driver? And is there anything from your form of racing which might have helped her? That's not, uh, I don't know if I've heard that last part asked before. Well, I can't say that there's much that I've, I, we can take out of drag racing to help us. But, but I do think, you know, just being around John and, and uh, seeing the way John works, you know, works the, the, the sponsorship side. Very different than us. You know, very different than my dad. I mean, they're obviously apples and oranges. But there's validity and there's reasons that both work. And we've seen this over the years. I mean, John's extremely successful in the racetrack, extremely successful, you know, financially. Uh, even though he'd like everybody to think he's not, he is. And, you know, so they both work and to be able to see it and understand how that works. Um, you know, for instance, I wear a team shirt. I wear a crew shirt, like all the guys. I walk around in a billboard everywhere I go. All the guys make fun of me. You know, you look at Hunter Ray, I love Hunter Ray, but he wears a black polo with a small DHL logo. I, I wear the full deal, head to toe. And why do I do that? 
because my sponsors pay me. Where did I learn that? From John. Wow. You know, that's not something that we do in IndyCar racing typically, but it's something that I myself adapted to, and now the rest of my teammates, you know, do that as well. But, you know, so that's a little bit different. What could they take from us? I think they could take a lot from us organizationally and stuff like that. But frankly, we never talk about it. It's not something that we that we do. I mean, they come over to our shop recently. You know, I showed them. Um, well, okay, I shouldn't say that. Courtney now wears accelerometers in her earpieces. She Ooh. had a concussion a couple of years ago. Uh, there was no earpieces. There was no way to tell what was going on. I knew she had a concussion. I took her myself in to get an impact test done because they don't do any standardized testing in NHRA. So what could she take? We got her a little safer. We got her better padding in her car. You know, she now uses a bead seat. She now uses uh, a bald spot sports, uh, you know, head surround, which came from IndyCar racing. So <clears throat> there are things, I think, from a safety perspective, they could certainly learn more from Dr. T, Dr. Trammell, Jeff, all of our staff. And I've been fortunate to, to kind of arrange a couple of meetings and get, you know, Dr. Trammell's been great. Jeff's been great. They've come over to force the shop several times to meet with them, tell them what they're doing, the latest, greatest stuff. So, I, you know, I've been – that's probably my one thing I can hang my hat on with them. The one that we've been using in recent times is the goggles. It was being tested. We did some testing. I did it. Some of the other drivers did it. Um, but it was not actually physically approved as a device yet, but I think it might be now. But the goggles is basically a dot that, that, that reads your retinas, and it moves around this, this screen basically like a virtual reality thing, and you have to follow them and identify what they're doing and all this sort of stuff. You can't trick the system. Mm. You're either you're on it, your, your pupils follow, or it doesn't. And if, if you're slow to react, it can tell that you're concussed immediately. So that that's pretty good because, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, man. Like when I got my first concussion, uh, which is my only to date, knock on wood. When was, um, when was uh, I'm forgetting when that was. Homestead 2008 in testing. But anyway, when I got my first one, I went into the medical center. I passed all the concussion tests. I, dude, I had no clue. I got back to the truck. I had no clue what was going on. Now, clearly today, the test that IndyCar does is, is completely different than it was 10 years ago. But my point is, like, it's, it, there's ways to kind of to fool the standard system, whereas with this new stuff, it's going to be much harder, and I'm sure there's more coming. Absolutely. Let's go to Noah, at BumpDraft76 via Twitter, who says, Graham, if you raced in the same era as your dad, how much of a competitor to him would you be? I love that question. Well, I would think, I would think down, we'd right? be, yeah, I mean, I think we'd be pretty good. I think all of us in our generation would be pretty good. Obviously, you know, the cream always rises to the top, and Dad was one of the best that, that you know, that ever did it. But, um, <clears throat> but you know, in our era, I think that the, the drivers make a huge difference. I think that, obviously, the team's got to be on top of their game. But when you look back at my dad's era, and he'll tell you this, you know, the top, you know, the top eight guys, the top eight guys and the top eight teams, eight cars were really good. They were well assembled. They were reliable. They were this and that, you know, but beyond that, it was, it could be a little bit hit and miss. I mean, today that's not the case. The top 20 guys have a chance to win each and every weekend. And we've seen that, you know, we've seen that repeatedly. So, um, you know, that can, that can certainly, uh, it's a different era, but, uh, I would certainly hope that I could give him a run for his money. Well, all I can say is if we made some of today's best wolf down a pack or two of Marlboro Reds each day, you can't say, you know, Bob style from back in the 80s, can't say how effective they would be, but it'd be interesting to find out. Uh, our, our man Tim Calabro, who always brings the fun question, says, uh, it's heavy but interesting. If Graham could cheat and win the Indy 500 and only he would ever know that he cheated, would you do it? You know, I, I know, um, no, because I'm, I'm too honest and, and, and I'm not good at holding secrets. So eventually it would come out, but, uh, That's a good answer. you know, I think, I think that this year we've got a great chance. I really do. I mean, I look at uh, our tests and October was really successful. I think with Alan McDonald, my engineer now, Alan's been on pole three out of the last five years, something like that. I wanted a couple of times, you know, I, I think that we've got, 
I think we've got a really good chance to uh, to be in a good spot come May. So I'm excited about it. I think that uh, a lot of people should should put some money on us. I know that our team has not been the odds on favorite in, in past years, but I think that we've identified reasons why we had our we after an IndyCar meeting, say we had our team meetings, sat down, look at all the development stuff that we're doing, and you know everybody's taking this pretty darn seriously. So I would expect good things from us. Eric Franklin on a related topic. This is Graham, in your eyes, what improvements do you, do you need to make to make the step to become a championship winner? Well, I was looking at it today, you know, and on average this year behind Dixon, I finished on average three positions behind him, but I qualified on average almost six positions behind him. And so if you look at that from a statistical standpoint, it tells you that I probably race as good, if not better but I don't qualify near as good. And so when you're trying to qualify, when you're trying to dig out of a hole all the time, you know, and that's part me, part, you know, we got to get, I will be honest, at a lot of places, I, there were a couple of tracks I certainly did, just did not get the pace out of the car. At the start of the year, I was uncomfortable with the new chassis. I was not on my game. I did not feel good behind the wheel. St. Pete, I was not comfortable ever. You know, I was worried about losing it all the time. At the end of the year, obviously, you get used to it, and, and it became pretty good. But qualifying is our Achilles heel. If we can qualify up front, we will win a lot of races. I mean, I'm, I don't I, – and I thought about this today. I mean, I'm very confident in saying that. Like, if we can qualify towards the front, you know, I really think that us as a team, you know, and, and myself, like, it would be hard to beat. But we can't keep qualifying – you know, 15 and expecting to win. I mean, it's, that's, that's going to be a hard deal to overcome. So, uh, and a lot of that lies on my shoulders. It's a great point you make. And, uh, you know, how many times have you and I spoken after a race or you and Robin and the conversation goes something along the lines of, man, you drove your behind off. And it's a compliment of the effort you just put in during the race but to your point, hey, maybe it'd be cool to have more conversations of, you know, you didn't really yeah, have to I mean, do anything extraordinary. Congratulations on the win. Uh, just that's an, issue, an easier you know, day. Uh, people never believe this, but the easiest races I've ever driven in my life were the races that we dominated. Detroit, a couple years ago, I put in half the effort that I normally do. And we won by, well, the one race, we're up 27 seconds on the field. We lapped Will Power, genuinely lapped him might never happen again in my life but you know the easiest races you drive are the races that are that are probably going to be the most successful so you know if you're trying constantly trying to dig from a hole it, it just isn't going to happen all the time let's go to one here from reddit l jones arena and i actually asked this question to your current teammate takuma sato years ago uh, he says, first of all, it's a non-mustache related question. I, we should get to that first. Shaving the mustache, was there any kind of bargain going on? You got the green light to do it again sometime? Uh, uh, tell us the story, man. I haven't gotten a green light to do anything, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was kind of thinking that by the time I got to St. Pete, that thing would be nice and thick and disgusting, and you know, the wife wife's not a fan, so... It is what it is. I'm I'm fine with it, but uh, you know we gotta we gotta had to take some photos today. We got media day coming up, so I, I didn't win that battle, but uh, but I might win the war. So we'll we'll find out at some point. My wife tells me every year on our anniversary, okay, I'm gonna re up your lease for one more year, and it's usually there's something contingent upon you know shaving the the beard down a little bit. So I, I get where Courtney's coming from. Um, yeah, not a fan. <laughs> The question, though, is uh, I've heard you run a larger diameter steering wheel than the other drivers so you can run more caster. Can you talk about the advantages of that setup and how it might compare to other drivers' setup in terms of steering effort and grip? Well, I definitely run more steering effort. I'm fine with a heavier steering wheel, but I'm also a bigger guy. So for some, they just don't want the load for an entire race. And trust me, there's some races I wish I didn't do it to myself, too, but... Uh, in the end, that's kind of what I've chosen to do over the years and just kind of stuck stuck with it, I guess. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, the, the bigger steering wheel just came from, 
you know, years of trying different stuff. I hated the small skinny wheels. I didn't feel like I was in as good of control over the car. I wanted a bigger steering wheel that slows down the motions. It, 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 it kind of eases some of the bumps. You don't get the, uh, the, the quick sort of movements, yep. um, that you do with a small wheel, things like that. So in essence, you can run a little more caster. It's also like running, you know, a different steering rack ratio. Um, you know, like you've slowed it down a little bit, but it helps me be a little smoother. Yeah. I get it on TV sometimes and stuff. It looks like I, you know, I got a lot more understeer in the car or whatever else just because of the movements. But, uh, you know, it's worked for me, um, over the years, a lot of guys try it and they hate it, but it, you know, it's worked for me and, you know, being a bigger guy, it feels more natural. You know, when I kind of hold a small steering wheel, you know, it feels like I'm, I'm squeezing my chest too much. You know, it's just, it's not, not fully comfortable for me either. Joseph Hall asks, with qualifying time so close, how much does your weight work against you, or does the ballast rule come into effect? And you and I spoke no, I about mean, this somewhat yeah. recently as well. Weight's a big deal, particularly in the sports cars. You know, we were looking at last year, you know, driving the same cars, Elio and Ricky. I mean, both of those guys are 50 pounds less than me. You know, and they say, you know, one ten pounds at a tenth of a second. So you're trying to overcome a lot with weight. In the IndyCar, some of that is compensated. But when you look at the maximums and the minimums, you know, even if my car is a minimum weight and, and Takuma has full weight on his car, we're still going to have a spread. They're still not going to be the same because you can't physically safely attach enough weight. IndyCar raised the, the, the minimum weights of the cars up five you know, this year to help me a little bit, I think, but I, I don't, you know, I'm always going to be at a disadvantage. I mean, that's the facts of life. It, it is what it is. I'm a bigger guy. And my dad was a bigger guy in his day. And, you know, unfortunately, would I like to be, uh, would I like to be six foot tall and 170 pounds? Yeah, I probably would, but that's not in the card for me. You know, I'm not going to get any shorter. And the likelihood is, you know, I work out all the time. I've got probably one of the healthiest hearts and, and cardiovascular shapes in this in this league. Yeah, guess what? I mean, I'm I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to be 180 pounds. It isn't going to happen. I mean, if I can dip into the 190s, I'm lucky, and I hate that, but it is what it is. You know, you just got to focus on, you know, on uh, on doing the best that you can. You told me your resting heart rate is some ridiculously low number, correct? Well, at one point it was 37. Um, you know, last year, I think when I went in for my physical, it was 39. So, you know, I, my heart rate isn't typically, you know, I mean, cardiovascularly, I've been fortunate to, to number one, have a good heart. Number two, I do it a lot uh, because, you know, it helps me at least stay somewhat thin. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely on the very low end of things. Let's go to Adam Smith who asked, Graham, what is one of your fondest memories growing up as Bobby Rahal's son, did you get to spend a lot of time in the garages? And if so, do you have any neat stories from your youth? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, you know. But I remember, you know, probably the, the most fun I had was with, with Dad, you know, when we used to go testing and stuff. And I got to, you know, sit right up next to the car when he was driving and, you know, and, and, and clean the wheels and do stuff like that when I was a kid. So, you know, I had a lot of fun with that but I would say the most fond memories I had were like in mid Ohio, oh, yeah. you know, going with my buddies. Um, you know, we would, we would stay in the front of the bus. Um, I'm sure dad hated it now thinking back on it, but you know, we would stay in the front of the bus and jump around all night and act like idiots and, and, you know, go terrorize the infield on golf carts. They were a lot more lenient <laughs> on kids driving golf carts and stuff back then. So, you know, it was, uh, those were the memories that probably formed even further my love, you know, for our sport. And, um, but those were, were the fondest times, you know, that I had. I mean, my nickname as a kid was the shadow. Um, I follow my dad everywhere. I idolized my dad. I still do. Um, you know, and, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely spent a lot of time with him. Well, hopefully it won't be too much longer until you got a shadow of your own there. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Let's see. Let's go to Keith Lee. says, hey, Graham, can you share your experience and the importance of working for such teams as Newman Haas and Chip Ganassi before coming to Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan? How did those experiences help prepare you to become a better driver for the, uh, call it the home team you're at today? Well, I mean, 
you know, it's good to see the way that everybody works. I mean, there's different atmospheres in the different places that you go. I remember the first time I came to Newman Haas, hard edge place, man. Very engineering driven. Uh, I felt like when I first got there, there wasn't a lot of smiles being shared around that place. You know, just from the standpoint that, uh, particularly up in the engineering office, it was just so focused. It was so focused, you know. Yeah, the mechanics, Donnie, Todd, you know, uh, Timmy, Coffee, oh, yeah. Dog, all the boys. Everybody, those guys all had fun. You know, we had a blast together. But it was a very, very serious, you know, environment and place. But um, Ganassi was, again, kind of that to the next level, almost. Um, I would say very, very serious, very focused. Um not as much of a family feeling atmosphere to me. And when I came, where I came from at our team, you know, being around Scott Remke and, uh, being around my dad and even TC, when TC was, was at, uh, with us, not Penske, Tim Sendrick. um, yep. you know, I mean, it was, uh, the guys like everybody had dinner together all the time. Everybody was shooting the, you know, the, you know what together. Everybody was having fun. You know, even when you were away from the racetrack, all the guys still hung out together because they were such good friends. You know, it was a different deal. And so that's what I grew up around. So when I first went to different places, it was like, whoa, okay. I mean, this isn't what I expect. But but what I learned was from my time between Newman Haas and when I went to Ganassi, you know, I drove for Dryden Reinbold. I drove for Sarah Fisher. Uh, I drove for a, a million different sponsors. I tried everything I possibly could. And... I learned the value of, of what it means to be in this sport. I learned the value of what it means to, to work hard, to be here. Um, that's what I've tried to tell guys like Connor Daly uh, and others who <clears throat> have the talent. But in today's day and age, what differentiates you know, the, the guys that are there and the guys that aren't is, is, is the, the work that kind of goes in behind the scenes and uh, everybody has talent. Everybody can win. But what I learned from my days in Newman Haas, you know, in 2010, I had agreed to a new contract. Uh, I was 19 years old. I was on top of the world. Things were great. Uh, we're going to go, or I was 20, whatever. We're going to go have some fun. And, you know, two weeks before the season, I just get told, Hey, we're not going racing. And, you know, you get dropped like that. Now what do I do? I'm watching the St. Pete race from home. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out sponsorship. I drove 27,000 miles in my Toyota 4Runner that year, looking for every penny I could possibly find. And eventually we scraped up a, t- a sponsor, up, you know, to go race in the next year with Ganassi. So, you know, you learn the value of what all these things are that have now carried me to where I am today. Um I'm probably not to toot my own horn, but I'm probably one of the top couple hardest working guys out here, whether it be with other businesses, whether it be finding sponsorships, doing appearances or whatever else. I often laugh when I, when I see, you know, videos of guys, I was laughing about the the new garden video the other day. I respect Joseph tremendously. I don't have the time to sit and shoot videos of me working out. I just don't have the time, you know? And so I, I laugh about some of this stuff. I just, it's so condensed for me, but it all came from those times. It all came from understanding and living in fear that the next day I might not have a job. And I still live that way. When I signed a five-year contract with everybody, with my dad, and everybody says, yeah, it's your dad. So, yeah, whatever. But no, it's all predicated specifically on sponsors. And I've been fortunate with United Rentals and with Fifth Third Bank and with Total and the One Cure and all the, 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 the partners that we have that I, I am directly linked to, to 99% of those deals. You know, when you work your way into these positions, um, we develop new partnerships now. Graham Ray Hall Performance has become part of that. We only use Total Oil in our store. You know, we do things that are now tied specifically in with our partners, and that's creating a further connection and, and, and uh, you know, opportunity for them that maybe others don't have. So there's a, there's a reason that I do most of the things that we do, but, uh, you know, I think my appreciation for it all came from those prior times to know that, you know, having a job, racing in this sport, doing what you love, it's not a guarantee. 
you know, it's a gift, and you got to work hard for it. And I don't mind sharing a little bit of the private conversations you you and I have had over the years. And this isn't blowing smoke; it's just you know being honest. Uh, I've appreciated about you that you have developed a an element of hustle within your personality as a direct result of the fluctuations in your career, right? Hot property coming out of Atlantic, <clears throat> big thing coming into Champ Car, etc. World falls out from under you, uh, you know, a year or two later, not too much later. And as you mentioned, you did have to try and reassemble your career from nothing. Your old man didn't write a check for you to go no. keep driving for Team XYZ and IndyCar. And you, as you mentioned, you did put a zillion miles on your on your Toyota, having to I go mean, and talk. And so again, I think it's that thing that not taking any stabs at New Garden or anyone else, but you have had that fear of I could have nothing tomorrow. So what should I do? Just drive my race car and enjoy it, and say I got to do it, but be at risk, or drive the race car but then bust my behind to actually develop a business infrastructure around me that if I decide to retire tomorrow, the checks don't stop coming in. Not many drivers your age think about that or make that happen at this point in time. Well, you know, yeah, everybody thinks off. If Graham's low on sponsorship, Dad will pay for it. No matter what anybody wants to think, that is not in the cards. And that is not feasible. And we looked a couple of years ago you know, and having to, to shut down. And when sponsorship got a little tough there at the start of 2015, um, you know, the first guy that got the call to tell to say the paycheck wasn't going to be coming that month was me, you know. And so th- this thing isn't – it's not a given to me that, that it's going to be there. And Dad and I have talked about it a lot, you know. And, and the, way that I, the way that I view it is, you know, if Dad – if dad's going to spend money doing something, should be doing what he loves to do, you know, not on me. I mean, that's not fair to, to, to me as far as my, my reputation, everything else. And it certainly isn't fair to my siblings who, you know, ultimately someday, you know, it's going to be part of their inheritance, whether I should be talking about that or not. It doesn't matter. It's the facts. I don't think it's fair to, to everybody else. So, you know, we've talked about it. We've been clear about that, you know, but I remember, I mean, honestly, man, for about two months, I didn't sleep. I remember calling Randy Bernard. I text him at 5, 4, 5 a.m., and I wouldn't have gone to bed yet. And I'd be pounding, trying to find money, you know, talking to him about – I remember there was a meat company out of Brazil that was looking at sponsoring IndyCar. Do I need to fly to Brazil? Do I need to go do that? I flew up, met with Buffalo Wild Wings. They tried to put together a vendor deal with, with any beer company I could possibly find and you know and bw3s and tyson's chicken and this and that i mean i tried to build these programs you know from the ground up go play golf with ceos that's ultimately how the service central deal went i flew down met orland wolford spent time with them played golf with him did the whole deal when i was five years old my dad said to me graham you need to learn how to play golf (laughs) and i'm five years old i thought what are you talking about And if anything, the greatest gift I've been given in life is not a single monetary thing. The gift I've been given is the wisdom I got from my dad, which has now benefited me. Wow. Telling me to play golf as a five-year-old. I don't know really any other IndyCar driver that plays golf. One other, I think. Okay? 90% of my business deals get done on the golf course. Now... Because when you go play golf with somebody, you got them for four hours, and it's just you, and they can't escape. You know, <laughs> it's it, it's true. You know, it's a great lesson, and you know, is that, learning is that about sponsor napping. It's not kidnapping. Maybe it's sponsor napping. And whatever like it is, but <clears throat> it's a great way to develop these relationships and build partnerships. And you know, out of that came doing these vendor programs. Out of that came, you know, B two B stuff. How do we make this all happen? And, uh, you know, and it's worked well. I mean, you know, even like I said with my performance shop, we built a, a, a Porsche a GT3 RS for the, for the PRI show for Total. I mean, you know, we're doing stuff, trying to leverage it and make a big deal for everybody. So definitely all has been pretty cool. Let's go to a question from Joseph Ostrowski, who says, There's a great article in Race Car Engineering Magazine about the Indy 500, which stated that the large aero balance shift when following another car was the main reason behind the lack 
of overtaking during the race last year. Do you agree with that? And exactly yeah. how does uh, how does that feel inside the car when it happens? Yeah, I mean, last year it would come super unpredictable. Like you'd get a lot of understeer, but then the rear would just go. So that's why you saw, you know, some very experienced guys lose it. Um, you know, for sure. So that 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 was a major major problem. But uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, we got a new wing this year. Might help a little bit. Uh, we got different downforce configurations that we tested that will help. And lastly, you know, Firestone's come up with a new tire and that will help the most of anything. You know, I mean, the tires, in my opinion, is probably the single most powerful thing that you can do on a race car. So, you know, if you get the tire combination right, you know, the front grip to rear grip ratio right, uh, you know, that's going to help. And so when we tested here in October, we tested a new, new front tire compound and it certainly helped tremendously. So I would, you know, I'm expecting uh, pretty good things. Scott Cooper asks, when you're testing a new setup on the car or a different setup, how do you get your best form of feedback, Graham, through the steering wheel or the seat of your pants? Well, both. You know, both. Um, I mean, when it comes to the rear of the car being loose, it's always the seat of your pants. You know, when it comes to the understeer levels, you know, typically it's going to be your hands. And so it's a combination of both. And visual, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, visually, you, you know, where you want to place it and how, how hard is it to get it there? Can you get it to that spot? If you can't, you know, it's probably understeering. If it gets there too easily, it's probably a bit loose. So it's a combination of all of those things, I think, that, you know, that make a difference into what you tell the engineer, how you tell it to them and, and you know, all that stuff. I listened to some fascinating insights last week in Graham from Christian Fittipaldi, uh, ex Indy car driver extraordinaire, who was telling me that the style of driving and feedback that some of the younger drivers uh, are developing these days are so t- completely different from what he came into the sport knowing. He said, for example, you know, uh, in the last couple years of his career now, he's been going and doing simulator time and he'll often do it with one of the younger teammates on the team and he'll and he mentioned that I'll go and hit the simulator and I'll be two or three seconds slower uh, we get to the track and we're right there but in the simulator it doesn't work for me and I said why not he said well these young guys they're so used to the simulators they drive with their eyes more than I ever have he says, I'm so accustomed to my behind and my hands and the physical inputs that the simulator doesn't replicate the same way that my brain is accustomed yeah. to. That, so I'm, the same as, I'm not as old as Christian, obviously, but I'm the same in that, in that sense. The simulator for me is a hard thing. It's been hard to get used to, um, to you know, adapt to. Um, you know, actually, I even think Takuma's the same. You know, but then you get a young guy, and they go in there, and they feel like it's great. So, you know, I think it just totally depends on on the way you've been brought up. I mean, I really do. I think it's I think it's that simple. You know, the simulator thing's a relatively new deal, and yeah, I'm not that old, but still, I feel like it kind of came after you know my my early days. Uh, it wasn't really that beneficial of a thing. All right, we've got a lot more questions, so I'm going to try and rock it through and prioritize here before we let you go, Graham. Uh, this one comes in from Stephen Kilsdonk, who says, given the past history of making cars go very fast at the Speedway, and you touched on this a little bit, how excited are you to have Alan McDonald join RLLR for the 2019 season and the month of May in particular? Yeah, no, I'm excited. Alan's going to be great. Um, cool. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a huge asset to us as a team. And, uh, you know, I got to drive this setup in, in, uh, in October on the Speedway, and it was fast. It was a lot faster than an old setup, I can tell you that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely excited to, uh, to see how it all pans out here. Let's go to Ron Thompson, who says, What surprised you most about Takuma Sato, your teammate, both on and off the track? Well, I mean, Takuma's the happiest man alive, I think. You know, he's always smiling. <clears throat> you know, a great influence on the team, which is really good. Um, but he's a very technical guy. I mean, I guess it didn't surprise me, but the level to which he is did. Um, you know, he, he likes to really dissect the data and, uh, you know, and be very involved in engineering and, and the decisions that are made. So, you know, that did, uh, that surprised me a little bit for sure. 
Steve Hunt asks a question, and it's news to me, so I hope it's accurate. He says, what's it like having Roger Glover from Deep Purple as an uncle? <laughs> Any backstage stories to tell, and has he ever seen you race? No, he hasn't. Um, you know, the truth is that uh, that I, I haven't seen Roger since I was a little, little kid. My brother and my mom saw him in Indianapolis recently. Uh, went to his concert, went backstage, saw him. But I've never been to a Deep Purple uh, concert. But, yeah, Roger was married to my Aunt Judy. In fact, her name is still Judy Glover. They got divorced, I don't know, 20 years ago. But, uh, yeah, my cousin Jillian, she lives over there in England. Um, she she was, you know, grew up here in the States but moved to, uh, moved to England, I don't know, 10 years ago and started a family and everything. So, yeah, it's uh, I guess it's cool. I don't know. I don't think about it much, but it's cool. The only person anyone would know I'm related to, my grandmother on my father's side, her maiden name was Chitwood. So Daytona oh, International Speedway, president, CEO, you name it, Joey Chitwood, uh, of the very famous uh, Chitwood stunt driving family. We're, uh, yeah. we're distant relatives. He's obviously fared better in life than I have. Not a surprise there. Uh, let's see. We've got three questions on the good old... Graham Ray Hall Performance Shop, and want to make sure we didn't skip any of that. Uh, I'm going to go with the funniest one first from our man Travis Bender, who does ask about the shop, but I want to take his last question, because I had it as well. What made you choose that purple for the Ford GT? <laughs> it looks like you killed a McDonald's character, almost, uh, to, to do that color. Uh, what were you, Well, you like it, obviously. How'd you end up with that, my man? I never I just, I, it. I just... You know, everything that I do, you know, if you follow us on Instagram, whatever, like, you know, most of them are customers' cars, but, you know, you know what I, like, the Ford GT, like, why, yeah, there's not that many Ford GTs, right? But why why be like everybody else? Yeah. You know, my whole thing is, be unique. I use these hashtags. It's a be unique, be you, be bold. Because why, you know, my, you gotta have fun with these things. Yeah, it's permanent. You painted the car, it's there. But you know what? Even I got three direct messages from three guys who work at the Ford factory, Multimatic, building these cars. Each one said it is the best one we have ever seen. Wow. Why do you think they say that? Because it's different. Are it's we talking about silver. the three the three blind guys at Multimatic yeah. hired or which one? Yeah. Sorry. Must be, but Sorry. I'm telling you in person, the color is so vibrant and, you know, it has effects. So why do I do this stuff? Number one, to be different. Number two, to build a brand. Yeah, my brand's not purple, but people take notice of my performance shop and the tags on Instagram and everything else when I do these things. When I put a set of wheels on it and I do a funky color, whether you like it or not, you see it, you notice it. That's what my job is. I have to build a brand and that's what we're trying to do. Well, throw the, throw some numbers on that sucker and turn up to Long Beach with it for the uh, IMSA race. And, and, and you know, ha- we'll have a third Ford GT in the field. So we've got the two other questions. One from Michael Everson, who says he, di- you know, has recognized you're the most entrepreneurial of all the active drivers, starting with uh, flipping high-end cars and now with your own tuner shop. Uh, and Michael Goodyear says, props to you for being a driver who really seems to enjoy everything about cars, not just racing. Talking about between your performance business and your own personal collections of cars and bikes, it's tr- uh, clear you are a true gearhead. Uh, and just ask if you could tell us a little bit about the uh, performance shop, what you do there. And he also asks, have there been, ever been any cars that you've passed on buying that you really regret? Well, yeah, I mean, the shop. So the shop started, you know, for years. When I was a kid, I always tinkered around. I always worked on cars in our garage. We had a lot of fun with it. Uh, built motors myself and a Subaru STI when I was when I was uh, 16, 17. Um, you know, and that kind of linked with the selling of cars. I started buying and selling cars, um, you know, in 2000 and probably like 2007 um, when I started getting into Champ Car you know, started to make my first paycheck. I, my, the first car I flipped was an E30 M3. Now it wasn't worth very much at the time. It, you know, they were, they were like low teens oh, yeah. at the time. And, uh, and I bought it and, and kind of did a refurbishing on it and, 
you know, cleaned it up, got stereo working, did a bunch of work on it, you know, and, and, and hit it at the right time where the car, when I went to sell it, you know, sold for 34,000. And that was a big deal. Like, wow, you know, we just doubled our money. Well, it just got me into other stuff. And so everybody thinks I started with high end cars. Everybody thinks, oh, dad, you know, Bob bought that for him. That's BS. The the last car, and you can ask him this, the last car he bought for me was the second car I ever had. And the only reason he bought it for me was because I convinced him that my, my first car is a Subaru STI. It blew up about 400 times. So <laughs> I physically, and I couldn't sell it because it wasn't worth anything at the time, you know, because it wasn't working. So he, he took care of me. Since that point, and it started with buying and selling and buying and selling, flipping and whatever else that then got me, you know, I, I met all these people from my time in racing. I met all the Porsche guys. Obviously I knew all the Honda guys and all that. And so it just evolved from there to what it is now. And now at Graham Ray Hall performance, you know, we'll build a, a track car for you. We'll build a street car for you. You want a high performance guy. I, I was, in the shop tonight talking to a guy who's got a Ford Raptor he wants us to build. We'll build it. We're there. I love you know, it. and I, and I'm I'm aware of all this. I mean I every single day I'm involved. If I'm in Indianapolis, I work out in the morning, go check out RLL. I work in the shop all day at at GRP. I mean, I this isn't just like some side gig. It's a real deal for me. Uh, I respond to all the sales emails. That's me. Um you know, I do it all, but basically now we also are a dealer. So we can buy the car, we can build the car, and we'll sell it to you complete. Or you buy the car, you tell us what you want done, we can do it, sell it to you complete. We can sell you a car stock, we can do whatever we want. So that was kind of my element, my way, you know, to uh, to take it to the next level. Because to be to be real about it, you know, the performance business, it's a hard business. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not going to make me rich overnight. It's not, you know, it's just not. But when we can add in this dealer element of it, it ties now further to our other dealerships and everything else we're doing. So it, it's been a great platform for me. And, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. And as I said, too, now it ties in directly with all of our sponsors. I do all my banking with Fifth Third. I use only Total Oil. You know, we've got Sunoco fuel in there. You know, I could go on all day. But, you know, Russo Cabinets, Mac Tools. What, I mean, what do you want me to say? I could literally go on all day. But we've tied tied directly all these racing partnerships into what we do each and every single day at the shop. So that's another great thing. Well, and again, for those who think I just gave Graham a free commercial, not the case. Uh, as a son of a mechanic and a person who that did all these things and did a lot of it myself for manufacturers uh i mean hell i think there's you guys might have pushed them into a lake but i remember what years ago 10 years ago you texted me you're like hey there's a couple of bmw 335 diesels that showed up here at dad's place for the bmw yeah. collection with uh marshall pruitt motorsports engineering on the rear wing is that you i'm like it'd be really strange if it wasn't but um again overstating the obvious here but I hope the Spencer Piggott's and Zach Veach's and Pato Awards and run down the list, I hope that beyond like, hey, Graham, how you doing? How was your day? How was your car? I'm hoping some of these younger cats coming into the series say, hey, big brother, could you tell me a little bit about the business side? Where would you suggest I start so that whenever my driving career inevitably ends, I'm not having to live off of savings or go, you know, sell my services as a track coach, driver, co-driver, whatever, in some wacky sports car race somewhere. So, Well, they are all asking me now about the car stuff. You know, hey, man, uh, how do I uh, how do I make money off of this car? What if I get this? You know, how can I? So I am starting to get those questions. Do I get questions about, hey, I want to start a business? No. But at the same point, you know, I, I, I've been – clearly, I've been lucky to be around this a long time. I've got great advisors with, you know, my dad. Everybody thinks my dad, but even more so Mike Lanigan, you know, on how yeah, to start businesses. Yeah. I mean, I own, I own a few hotels with, with Mike. Um, you know, so I've been lucky to get 
to get some opportunities. But, you know, it's for me, the greatest lesson I learned was in 1980, whatever it was, 88, when Honda came to my dad and said, hey, we want you to. We want you to run our IndyCar team. We're going to start it up in a few years. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. We'll pay you X. And Dad said, you know what? Don't pay me. Give me a dealership. Mm. And you know, today, that little Honda store has now turned in to a company that almost does a billion dollars a year in revenue. Pretty cool. (laughs) So when you take that lesson... Now we and know how Bob realize, pays for his wine consumption. All right, now, huh. now I'm putting it. Well, all he doesn't together. own all of it anymore. He got divorced. Remember? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, that's right. But, but, but my point is, you take that mindset, you learn from your elders, and realize, you know, forget it's not. You know, it's not about today. It's not about next year. Because I sure hope I have a job next year. But 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when I got a family, I got kids put through college, you know, what What can I do? And my opportunity is now to build brands. My opportunity is now to invest in stuff because someday, you know, you're not going to have the income if you don't if you don't get ahead of it in the short term. And so that's kind of been my my thing, you know, is to try to figure out how to how to make it all work and leverage, you know, racing into into everything else. All right, going to go rapid fire on the last few we got here and then uh, let you go, my man. This comes in from our pal Jordan Darwin. Graham, you've said that Marshall knows what is happening at RLL before you do. Do you see an increased role within the team for him, either in management or something else over the next few years? Well, Not at this time. Consider, yeah, <laughs> considering you said you want to succeed, the answer is a hell no. So, yeah. No, no. Unfortunately, not at this time, but I'm sure Bob will keep giving him the inside scoop. Well, again, as I tell folks, I was so good in IndyCar, I'm now a reporter. Uh, Mike Jablo <laughs> says, Graham, what was it like to drive for Team Penske? And I guess uh, that might be more of a RP related question. And any surprises of uh, being inside that program, even if just for the endurance races? No, you know, well, first of all, it was a great opportunity for me. I had a lot of fun there. Um, You know, I was disappointed to have to step aside. A lot of people thought I was booted. I wasn't. I I was asked to keep to come back, and uh, uh, I, you know, I thank the team. I thank Honda for that. I thank my my friends Elio and Ricky. They were they were adamant, you know, that I that I do come back, but uh, it just wasn't. Unfortunately, physically, it wasn't in the cards at the time. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's a great team, as we would all expect. Um, nothing really surprised me. I mean, very engineering driven, very detail driven. Uh, you know, but uh, actually, I will say one thing surprised me. It was much more of a fan. It was much more of an RLL family atmosphere than I expected. Really? You know, having been around um, the Canassies of the world and stuff, I, I, I kind of expected that intensity. And uh, and that's not what I got. I mean, you know, Vance and all the boys on the car that I drove, we we had a blast. I mean, it was a great time. So, uh, you know, yeah, they're very serious about certain things. Um, but uh, it was a, it was it was a great time. Scott Wharton says, Graham, what is your favorite pizza in the Columbus area? Is it Donato's, Massey's, Eagles Pizza, New Albany, maybe? Yeah, I know you got to go Eagles in, in New Albany, a local, local spot. But, you know, Donato's is a great local company, too, that grew and expanded like 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 crazy and sold off. I think the McDonald's ended up getting it back in the family. Uh, I've met Jane, um, whose family started, her dad. She owns it now. Great people. So, uh, I mean, in the year that I lost my job, that was one of the companies I pitched. I went there. They made me some awesome pizzas on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just didn't didn't work. It was actually right as they were reacquiring it, and so it was kind of a a, a rebuild time. We're going to go into the couple of quick overtime questions here. Robbie Bergren says, "What's the best prank you've ever played on your dad?" Oh, I told him a girlfriend was pregnant once, um, <laughs> <laughs> and he 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 bit he bit on it. And uh, how long do you let that ride? Him- uh, I was a little. It was a few hours. I let. It was my uncle, my mom, and my dad. I told them all at the same time, and 
<clears throat> it was uh, it was pretty funny because they started calling each other, freaking out, trying to figure out what we're doing. So that was pretty good. Yeah, uh, that one kind of wins. Uh, that one absolutely wins. Uh, let's see. Nick Dovbiniak says, Graham, you've been given a large bag of money to do the Dakar Rally, but your co-driver must be from the IndyCar paddock. Who do you choose, and what Dakar vehicle are you in? You know, I don't know. I don't know on vehicles, but, uh, but you know, I, I, I would... Uh... I don't know. I, mean, I think I'd love to. Uh, Rossi comes to mind. He was a badass was, at the Baja. Yeah, yeah. No, I think Al would be fun. Like, actually, I've been talking to Al about getting together, and because I was asked to do Baja three years ago, um, but I couldn't. It clashed with Courtney's last race. Uh, but Jeff Proctor, who owns that team, is a, a very close friend of mine, and so uh, I've been all over Proctor. In fact, I do even text him today. Just saying, come on, man. You know, get let's get a car together. Just let Al and I do it together. Forget forget you off road guys. Let's just let us go have some fun. So we'll see. Let's see. Jeff Hildebrand says, Graham, as a fellow Ohioan, I've always followed you and Bob. Just curious, what high school did you attend, and did you get a chance to play sports? He says you have a perfect middle linebacker mindset. <laughs> no, I was never allowed to play football. My dad said it was unsafe. If that makes any <laughs> sense. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but I went to New Albany high school right outside of Columbus there and I played soccer, you know, as a kid and played basketball, realized that I, I was not, even though I had the height, I did not have the rest of the skill set. Um, but yeah, I mean, I played, uh, I played soccer. I was actually pretty good, um, pretty good forward. Uh, I was too lazy to run back and play D, but scored a lot of goals. Wow. I don't know if you guys are planning or coming out coming out or not, but Paul Ingram says uh, you're not on the list of the drivers for the upcoming Laguna test. Uh, any chance you can get in the yeah, cele- celebrity amateur field for the A and AT and T Pebble Beach Pro Am that week? He says among the drivers, are you the best golfer? Yeah, yeah, for sure I am. Um, no, no, none other really plays that much, but yeah, um, I'll be there. I'll be testing there, and uh, and to answer the AT and T part, yes, we tried to do it, but unfortunately, we have a clash. So, you know, maybe in the future, um, my my buddy Ricky Fowler was working on getting me hooked up with Butch Harmon to get a couple of lessons and stuff, and you know, just to, I mean, I I play to about a four handicap, but I'd like to really be, you know, be scratch or a plus. So we'll see. Sounds like a good opportunity in the Bay Area, you and fellow golfing enthusiast Steph Curry. Right, that could be a fun little exchange. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we've texted back and forth about going out and playing. I met him at, at Sonoma that one year, and you know, we texted about you know going and playing, but it just never, never, never worked yet. All right, down to our last couple of questions for you, my man. Our, our pal, drunk at Indy at drunk at Indy, the best <laughs> Twitter handle. He says, uh, "Graham, thanks for taking the time and good luck this year." Don't think I've had a chance to ask you this one. What is your favorite Keanu Reeves movie? I don't even know. Oh, I've only seen one, I think. Point Break. Point Break. <laughs> Isn't that one? It is. It is. <laughs> well, we okay, we're going to have a Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure movie night for I, sure. I, I swear to God, I think that's the only one I've ever seen. I, you, see, here's the thing. My wife, she's always on me, Graham, you never watch movies with me. I'm like, listen, I watch two things on TV, okay? Ohio State football or hockey. I, I thought you were going to say The Bachelor, and that would have been the funniest aside, thing ever. Literally, literally, aside from that, although I watched a great show last night on PBS about the USS Indianapolis. But anyway, a different topic. No, that, I, 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 a I, fantastic, a, fantastic piece. Yeah, I fully agree there. I'm just not a, I'm just not a TV guy, so or movies, so wow. kind of got the wrong guy. Well, I don't know when you joined ISIS, but uh, we're glad we have you in IndyCar. Uh, Andy Bauer, there again. There are a lot of hair questions, so I'm doing my best to not uh, uh, tune you up too bad. Andy Bauer asks Graham, "Will you have your dad's hair in 20 years?" And Brad at Bzad says, "Which is more scary, blowing a tire going to turn one at Indy, or becoming a cue ball like your old man?" Blowing a tire for sure. <laughs> uh, the cue uh, ball part is probably just a given. So at some stage, it's gonna it's gonna happen. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I tried the stash thing, didn't work out for me. 
you know, maybe the future has one in store for me, but at this point, I'm just really, I'm really not sure. But, you know, my my dad constantly reminds me that I need to call Rogaine and get some help here nice. at ASAP, but I'm hanging on. I'm hanging on for now. I, I'm 30 now. He lost his hair at 25, so I, I beat his record, um, you know, and uh, we're going to hope it stays for a little while longer. Mine's still holding on. One of my favorite lines of all time, though, was back in 2001, my final year working in IndyCar with uh, the Schmidt, uh, Sam Schmidt Motorsports, one of the uh, lead mechanics, Paul Taylor, told me my hairline was like an Italian tank. Five gears, all reverse. So that has, uh, that has stuck with me. All right, let's, uh, let's go to the last question here from our man, Joshua Renneker. says, Graham, nice uh, that you have an I.O. to your O.H. in the series with Zach Veach, that being Iowa's Zach Veach, says, well, we enjoy seeing what Ohio can do in 2019. He says, my question is, what's the most interesting Graham Rahal thing that you've been asked to sign by a fan that you didn't know existed? Oh, well, uh, oh, so not a body part. Yes. So you're talking about anything. Yes, I know a lot of men ask you to sign certain body parts, but uh, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, right. I, you know, I don't. I man, I I feel like I'm letting them down without answering this thing properly. But I don't really know. I mean, anybody make any weird signs or 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 make you know make something at home to have you sign or give you? That's a that's yeah, a somewhat I mean, common I get, thing. I get I get a lot of we we get a lot of stuff. You know, people ask a sign that they made or. Um, get homemade bobbleheads or gifts like that which are kind of kind of funny i mean sometimes people give you candy and stuff it's like oh no you know like a kid i'm not sure i can trust this but uh yeah i mean um I, i've signed just a, a pretty much about any anything under the sun i haven't seen anything super weird so if you want to be if you want to be weird go ahead and make something up and uh and i'll see you in ohio or wherever else maybe that's the challenge maybe that's the perfect yeah. close to the episode Hashtag, what's the strangest thing you can give Graham to sign? I love... There you go. I mean, granted, and, and maybe we'll close on this, the strangest thing I know you want to receive is that gift from the quilt lady at the Indy 500. Because you, <laughs> you get that for winning the race. It's the most bizarre thing it. the winners receive. But yeah, uh, I'm sure I'll you'd love it. to get one of those. If I win it, I'll take it. Take anything. All right, my man. Well, as always, thank you not only for your time, but appreciate all the help you lend me with whatever I'm doing to help try and grow this little podcast. So thanks for taking some time on a busy Wednesday, my man.